Loss comes in many forms, and usually in unexpected ways. It can be devastating, leaving you facing an uphill struggle to go on with life without someone you thought would always be there. But life does go on, and even in the deepest despair, we can find hope. Welcome to Grief Relief with your hosts, Drs. Gloria and Heidi Horsley, brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation, helping people find hope after loss. And now here's Dr. Gloria and Dr. Heidi. Welcome to the Grief Relief Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we have got a wonderful show today on rebuilding your life after loss. Mm, I love that. I love that title. Mm -hmm. Because we've got Alan Peterson coming on the show, and he's going to talk about how he's rebuilt his life. And you know, after his death of his daughter, Ashley, mm -hmm. and he's done a lot of singing on our shows, and uh, so some of the audience might recognize him. Absolutely, and he's also an inspirational speaker, and he has traveled all over the United States in, with angels across the USA giving concerts and messages of motivation and transformation to people that have had a loss. And don't forget his wife, Denise, that takes him yeah. on all these journeys. Mom, I always say Denise is the wind beneath Alan's wings. Without her, all this could not happen. Absolutely. And then an, a person that I had just met recently, Ann Costaldo, and mm -hmm. you met her uh, when you went up to do a program with her with the Tony Brown Foundation, right? right? Yep. Ann is wonderful. She is with the Tony Brown Foundation, and she lives up in Connecticut. And we're going to talk all about her foundation and how she really inspires people to find purpose and meaning after loss. And she does that in memory of her son, Tony, right? Yes, absolutely. And he's, he was an extreme sports kid and he's adorable. Yeah, and then we're gonna interview Chris Munch and yeah. he is so unique. He, he is. He? he absolutely is. He helps people build birdhouses and many of them don't even own a bird. <laughs> <laughs> and this is part of healing your life. It and is. And dealing with it. It's a metaphor for your life and for the grief process. And the so, Birdhouse Project is. Yeah, and we're going to love to talk to people about the Birdhouse Project. And he again does it in the name of his child. Yep, in the name of Blake. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be exciting. Well, let's get started with Alan and talk about how okay. he's transformed his life. Alan. Hey, Alan. What well, fun to have you in. Here. Thank you. Well, it is, it's always my honor to be on Grief Relief and be on the radio shows. I just believe so much in what you are trying, the message you're trying to get out. And today's show is a great example of that, rebuilding your life uh, after loss. And, uh, you know, people do it in different ways. And I think mm -hmm. today's interesting because you have three different people who did it in different ways. So thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Yeah, well tell us, where were you? Tell us about your daughter, Ashley, dying. And I mean, we know you as this guy who's, you know, upbeat and helping other people and playing your music and selling your CDs to people and, you know, with your joyous music that you write yourself. Were you always there? And you wrote music before, but didn't you tell me you had a time when the music didn't come uh, anymore? Yeah, my daughter Ashley was 18. She died in a, an automobile accident in August uh, of 2001. Mm -hmm. I'd lived and written music in Nashville and been around the entertainment business and radio business, but I believed I'd never write a song again. I was very fortunate. I really, uh, one reason I like to support programs like yours and be here whenever I can is because I believe if we can get the message out to people who feel hopeless, that hope can be found. Mm -hmm. That 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 an, a fulfilling life is attainable right. going through grief. You know, I remember someone early on telling me that grief could define me or grief could refine me. Oh, like mm. And when I didn't think, you know, I thought, well, well what am I going to do and, and where am I going to go? I began to ponder that. I began to think, well, the life I had, I'm not going to have. Mm -hmm. And But the life that I can have, I can begin building. And so I began to take my music when I thought I'd never write again and began to just basically write my story, but write all of our story. I really felt mm -hmm. like I was the songwriter who would write the story of loving someone so much, having them die, missing them so much, and then walking back into life. And that's really what my life's been about for the well, last 10 years. What's amazing about that message, is it's your message, but it's everyone's experience. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? And my mom and I are always saying, you know, lean on our hope until you find your own. Because sometimes you need people like Alan and my mom and me. You need to look at them and say, they're, they're not only surviving, but they're thriving. And if they can do it, maybe I can eventually. Yeah, we, you know, we spent the weekend, uh, many of us, 
uh, at the Bereaved Parents of the USA mm -hmm. Conference. And I think one uh, wonderful thing about doing that work is people will come up to you and say, you know, you gave me something today mm -hmm. that I can apply to my life and I'm going to go home and do that. Now, we don't, you know, save anybody's life. People will come up sometimes and say, you know, Alan, your music uh, saved my life. And I always pause and say, you know what? My music didn't change your life. Give yourself the credit. Mm -hmm. Now, if something I said inspired you to take an action that changed your life, I'm so honored to be a part of that for you. So all the different messages from uh, people who are on your programs and, and write on the Open to Hope website, they just offer different little pieces that people can pick up and put in their arsenal. Uh, you know, Glenn and Tanya Lord, the Grief Toolbox, I know mm -hmm. you've had them on. Mm -hmm. And that's their philosophy, too, is to, to, to find the tool that works for you, the right tool for the job. Yeah. And um, so I'm blessed to go out and, and put that message out there of proactive grieving, as Mitch Carmody and myself uh, call it, where you take control of your grief journey and you chart the course because our love story is not over. Our love story did not end at the funeral at the wake, at the cemetery, our love story continues. Mm -hmm. And it's what we do with that continuing love story for our children, our loved ones, uh, that makes all the difference, I believe. So okay. tell me, uh, you've just heard Ashley's been killed. Mm -hmm. Where are you? <laughs> well, I was on the road in Tucson, Arizona, on the side of a, the interstate when wow. I found out. And I remember you know, some people don't remember the first thing they said or did, but I absolutely do. I just marched around my car saying, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. What do I do? Mm -hmm. You know, life doesn't prepare you right. for information like that. I just feel very fortunate that I found a wonderful support group and a grief program and that I began to get good grief How education. Did a guy that went to a grief program. I know, right? Yeah, How did but you nine find other it? women. And boy, it was, yeah. And how did you find it? I actually, somebody referred it to me. Okay. And uh, I was just, just I, I always feel fortunate. I, 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 I say there are no accidents. It was where I was supposed to be. And even early on in grief, I began getting the basics of good grief information that, that healing begins with helping and some of these things. Mm -hmm. And that to remember that Ashley lived. And even when it was hard to apply it, those basic tenets of the grief journey and processing grief would help me as the years went by because I could implement what I learned early on. I always tell people, educate yourself. So, well, well, and the mm -hmm. other piece is, you know, every, people are always saying, well, I don't know what works for me. And I say, well, when, when you feel a shift and you start feeling a little bit better, think about what you're doing. That's right. Because different things work for different people, as you said. Right. And not everybody's going to write a book mm -hmm. or build a new wing to the hospital. For some people, it might just be becoming a better listener. Yeah. Uh, it, and, you know, you, you find your way through grief. And, I, I, you know, we meet people all the time and say, I don't know what works for me. Well, keep trying things. Right. It's a process of elimination. Something is going to stick that, that's going to work for you, that's going to bring you a, a little drop of healing here and there. We all want that, you know, uh, event that is our healing, but it doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. Yeah, that huge thing. And it's, it's gonna I always change tell people, life. healing comes a drop at a time. And I, and I always also say, even when you're early on in grief, you can be of service. Absolutely. Because you can allow people to serve you. Yeah, and you. And that's being of service to them. And you say something, Heidi, that's that's true. That when you reach out and help people, you begin to see the worth and the value in yourself because mm -hmm. grief. Can, can be so hard on our self-esteem and our self-worth. And giving l lets us realize or allows us to realize that we do have value. We do have mm -hmm. something. We continue to have something to offer even when we don't feel hope. So I'm sitting here on and I'm thinking, here's a guy saying this, yeah. and I'm trying to get my husband to say this, mm -hmm. and I want him to go to Greek group, and he's not crying, and he's not doing this, and he's not doing that, and, you know, I just can't get the guy to move. What do you say? You know what I say? Grief, there's not a lot of guys I know that want to go sit in a circle and, and talk when they're the, maybe the only guy in the room. But I'm guessing that your husband or anybody else's husband, they do grieve. Uh, you know, grief is what goes on on the inside and, and how they express their grief. They might be out in the garage, you know, hammering a, a birdhouse like we're yeah, going exactly. to, or, no, or punching a punching bag or going for a jog. You know, we tend to want to think that we all need to grieve the same way. Right. I happen to be, I've been a writer my whole life. You know, I hung out in the poetry club, so I was that guy anyway. Mm -hmm. So I can write my feelings. It comes easy for me to express my feelings. But not every guy can do it, but that doesn't mean I'm processing my grief any slower or faster 
than the guy who doesn't talk that much mm -hmm. or doesn't cry that much. We all do it uniquely and we find our ways to do it. Oh, Alan, that is such so great what you're saying. And, and how do people find you and how do they get your records and all that kind well, of thing? Well, if they go to my website, which is angelsacrossthusa.com, I believe they can find uh, everything I've got there. So angelsacrossthusa.com, find us, contact us, write us. We, uh, and you travel around the United States and he is a great person to see. So you might want to We'll be in a city him. near you. A city near Wherever you. Wherever that is, I promise you, <laughs> we will Alan be in a city near you. want Alan to come to a city near you, contact him and he'll be there. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for being on, Alan. And we're going to have you stay and talk with Ann Castaldo, too, with us Great. in a moment. So Thanks, hi. Alan, yep. for everything you're doing you. and for being you. Thanks. Yep. And so, Heidi, we're going to have Ann Castaldo on now, and we're excited because we've got mm -hmm. a roll in from the Tony Brown Foundation. Oh, good. Wonderful. And you were up in, where does she live? And she lives in Monroe, her. Connecticut, and we went up there for a whole day of healing, and she's doing a lot of events like that, so I'm excited to see this roll out. And what's really neat is you live in New York City, and you can yes. be up there for the day and get home, right? Absolutely. It's, it's a very short trip for me. Yeah, so people yeah. that are around in the New York City area, they might want to look for what the Tony Brown Foundation's doing. So okay. let's see that roll in now. Okay. I'm Ann Castaldo, founder of the Tony Brown Foundation and Tony's mom. Our family started the Tony Brown Foundation after Tony's death from medical complications on July 11, 2009. Tony lived a life full of adventure and risk. He had packed more life into his 24 years than most can do in a lifetime, and he would never let anything stand in the way of accomplishing the goal he would set for himself. We have set the mission of the Tony Brown Foundation to inspire and support individuals to lead a fulfilled life after suffering the death of a loved one. The Foundation's mission is based on the idea of being able to pursue an interest that will let others lead an enriched life moving forward. The Foundation offers support to those walking the grief journey through support groups, candle lighting events, grief workshops, and many other activities. If you'd like to learn more about the Foundation, visit us on the web at thetonybrownfoundation.org. Well, Anne, how hey, exciting Anne. it is to have you come in today. Thank you, you very much. You. Mm -hmm. So good to see you. Good to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thank come you. and join us and your friend Alan. Yeah. Hi, Anne. Hey, Alan. Well, Anne, yes. so great. And Heidi was so impressed and so spiritually moved by the things you're doing and by oh, your foundation. You. You're, doing, you're just doing so much for the community. Yeah, and so talk to us about what you're doing, how the foundation has kind of transformed and changed over time. Well, you know, it started out simply as a scholarship fund mm -hmm. for a candle lighting event also. Um, and. I've incorporated my boys into it. They've come mm -hmm. more on board with wanting to support Tony's life. Mm. And the, your boys run the roll out? They were. Okay. Um, so David and Danny, they want to, their grief process is emerging. As they saw mine emerge, theirs is emerging. Mm -hmm. And they want to support Tony's life. They want to acknowledge that he lived and help others find a way that they now, how did Tony die, and how long has it been? It was four years on July 11th that mm. he died. And, and he, I, as I said to you, that's my son Scott, Scott's yes, birthday, birthday yes. July 11th, was I when did. Tony, Tony yes. left us. He yeah. did, physically. I still feel him every day. Of course. He's mm -hmm. with course. me all the time. And I do believe that he inspires everything that we do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, so but he died from medical complications after a procedure. Very unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. um, and he was, a, he was, I love him because he had so much energy. He was a, a kid that was a skateboarder and a skier and a snowmobiler. I mean, tell us more about him as a person. Oh, my gosh. He was a determined young man. Mm -hmm. You know, when he was young, we butted heads a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, he did not know no for an answer. That was not his way. Uh, great kid, heart full of gold, um, you know, and any adventure, you know, whether it be bungee jumping, parachuting, mm -hmm. you know, he was going to do it. He had a life full of ahead of him. He wanted to film extreme sports. Wow, that's neat. Uh, yeah, he was going to film school in three weeks from graduating. Mm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. So tell us what the foundation's up to mm -hmm. now and what you're doing and what people can expect. Well, we have big plans for the foundation. Good, love it. We want to start to inspire people. One of my big goals is to open a healing center mm -hmm. up in the Adirondacks where we have property that Tony absolutely loved up there. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping to open some kind of healing center that will provide like a bed and breakfast for families mm -hmm. and a retreat to get away and also to provide activities that will help them enrich their lives, give them an opportunity to pursue something they may find interest in. Mm -hmm. But we're also going to be offering 
that along the way with being involved in extreme sport camps and offering mm -hmm. scholarships to those, film schools, different opportunities for people to explore. Great. That's wonderful. And I know you had everybody up there. Alan, you went up to... Oh, I, you know, I've known Ann Costeldo now for a couple, three years. And yep. when, uh, you know, Tony didn't take no for an answer. No, he didn't. And, you know, the Tony Brown Foundation is meant to inspire. And even those of us who've been out doing this work are inspired by Ann. When I first met her, she just said, hey, what's it going to take to get you to come to my community here in Monroe and, uh, and to do a concert and an event? And, and she went and made it happen. And then she said, well, you and Mitch Carmody, you do the day with Mitch Carmody. What's it going to take to get you here to do that? And, and I just watched her uh, go out of her comfort zone to, uh, to do more and to give more. And in doing that, she inspires those of us that do this work. And so she's somebody I'm so very proud of. She's got that heart mm -hmm. of a giver and that compassion uh, that just makes those of us who do this work want to partner with her. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's beautiful. And so, I mean, you're the proof that, you know, you just decided you wanted to help people. Yes. Uh, you just, and you just learned uh, uh, on the fly. You weren't an <laughs> event planner no. or anything like that. I mean, so what, what, what inspired you just to, to, to do your first event? And what was your first event? Well, my first mm -hmm. event was the candle lighting for TC. Oh, okay. um, I, there was, for, an, for, it for, was not for compassionate friends. Okay. They didn't have one around me. And okay. I needed one. Okay. And that was just my own Out grief. of your own need. Out of my is, own uh, need. Yeah. Um, so we put together that and I noticed people started to give me money, uh -huh. which mm -hmm. I did not want. So I started a scholarship foundation. Uh -huh. uh, and how long after that? Uh, that was the, Tony the December died. after Tony died. So okay. that was 2009. And it just continued to grow. My first big event was having Alan out. Mm -hmm. And I noticed the need of the people. They just, they loved it. They mm -hmm. were inspired by it. So come this fall, I'm actually doing a two-day event. Oh, great. And we're going to have mm -hmm. Alan and Mitch out and Darcy Sims uh -huh. and kind of a day of hope, healing, and friendship, similar to the day we did in February. Um, our community needs it desperately. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're close to the Newtown disaster. We are. We are. And, you know, those families are kind of separate. They have their own huge grief that they're dealing with. But the community in the whole, you know, is so full with bereaved people. Well, and what I found when you brought us up there, um, Anne, is that when we were doing the event, because you are just one town over from Newtown, that the Newtown situation triggered everybody's own grief reaction to their yes. own losses. It did. Yep. Which it makes did. sense. Yeah. I mean, I worked, I've worked with 9-11 for 10 years, and I know I got calls from people that were, you know, had had someone die in 9-11 after Newtown because it just brought up their own grief all over again. Exactly. Yeah, those those uh, reminders and mm -hmm. anniversary reactions are, yes. are really uh, tough to deal with. Well, we want to thank you for the work oh, you're doing you. and, and for everything that you've done in honor of Tony. And we hope it's that amazing. we through um, can help you through the Open to Hope Foundation and mm -hmm. thank you. the work that you're doing, whatever we can do to help support you. Thank you very much. Thank this. you for Would having me on here. It's been an honor. Oh, great. Thank, thank you, you for being on. Thank you so much, Anne. Like, like my mom said, you're doing so much to help people find hope after loss. Yes. Thank you. And now we're going to have our friend, and you know him too, Chris Munch, come on. Yes. And uh, he's the man who builds the birdhouses. And mm -hmm. it's going to be fun to hear what he does and how he uh, frames, the, you know, full framing the house. And uh, so we'll be seeing a roll in with Chris, talking a little bit about the work he's doing. And then we'll have him come in and show us how to do a birdhouse. Fun. I'm excited. Right. I love it. Okay. I love what he's doing. About 15 years ago, I ended up divorced. It, I struggled with it. Absolutely, I struggled with it. To be honest with you, I struggled with it just across the street from this house. But in that rebuilding process of that house, I started to find my life again. Started to pick up the pieces and put it back together. And then five years after that divorce, tragedy struck. I remember waking up in that house, the phone rang. And it was a policeman and he said, hey Chris, he said, this is Sheriff Hurdle. Your son was in an accident tonight and he didn't make it. The world I knew, everything that I'd put together, the businesses I'd built up to that point, absolutely made no sense. And honestly, I didn't care about them anymore. So I had to find meaning in my life. Prior to experiencing tragedy in my own life, there wasn't a project that I didn't hesitate to pick up these tools and rebuild what was broken. Then I started thinking about my own personal life after tragedy struck me. 
Why am I afraid to pick up the tools and rebuild? Hi, I'm Chris, founder of The Birdhouse Project. Join me as we work through these pieces and rebuild our lives together through the walls of a birdhouse. Wow, Chris, I hey, love Chris. that rolling about you. It's so good to see you. Thank mm. you. Hello. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. So here we've got the birdhouse, the Here's hammer, the birdhouse. The, all the stuff. I love it. Absolutely. So tell us about the birdhouse. How did you get into it and what, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. I guess the meaning of it is really... <clears throat> well, the birdhouse project is, um, it's, I'm a builder, I'm a renovator of homes. And um, after I started, uh, I became a high school woodshop teacher. And through that process of becoming a teacher, I started thinking about my life. And I thought, if I can renovate houses, why can't I renovate my life? And, and just kind of accidentally stumbled across, um, kids learn best by picking up tools, by picking up objects. They can remember it. It's a, it's a collaboration of the heart, mind, and hands. I connect the eyes. Oh, the, I like that, the, the heart, touch. mind, and hands. Yeah. yeah. And so I just really attach specific questions to each piece. And as you pick up each piece, it's symbolic of rebuilding. Um, it's, it's really interesting. It's, a, it's just kind of a guide to introspection, to reflection on your own life. The Birdhouse Project honestly really doesn't have anything to do at all with birdhouses. It's, uh -huh. it's kind of funny. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just a metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, and I get people to pick up those pieces and parts. Um, is, so is basically it's a, it's what it a is. metaphor for your journey. Absolutely. Okay. Um, this, is, this represents you as a person. Okay. Um, you'll see, you can see inside the birdhouse it's written. Yeah. Um, and, and the writing, uh, as a person goes through the project, they write their thoughts, their feelings. Who am I? What am I feeling? How do I react to all my emotions? <clears throat> okay, so you've got in there, let's see, what does it say? Yeah. It's got, it says, foundation, who am I? Yeah. Okay. Just a building block of who we are. I look at a house and I look at a concrete wall and I think, you know, if that foundation isn't stable, would I want to rebuild on that? And mm -hmm. so it's really asking a person what building blocks of my past experiences are stable and which building blocks are not. Mm -hmm. And so the Birdhouse Project gets you to take the pieces of your life that you need to work on and take them through a series of questions and set goals and create affirmation and find resources. So I was in your workshop and you had this, this was all flat, can I see that little house? Oh, absolutely. This was all flat and a cardboard and then I wrote on the pieces and I, what would I write on this wall? Um, the side walls were about uh, your emotions. So I put my emotions down, anger, frustration, right. whatever. And then the opposite wall across from it would be how I react to it. So okay. when I get angry, I vacuum. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I love it. Can you come to my house when you're angry? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I get asked that a lot. <laughs> but in, in the shelter, the, what's, what's really interesting about the Birdhouse Project is it continues to evolve, like I continue yeah. to evolve. Um, the walls are similar to what they were when I first started, but as I'm learning and growing, I'm starting to see new things develop. Um, it's it's kind of like, you know, I'm a builder, so if I pick up a tool and then I learn there's a better tool um, to use to get a job done, obviously I'm going to switch to a better tool. And that's the whole goal is to give people tools mm -hmm. that when they walk away, they'll remember it. Um, they know what a hammer's for, and then I, I, you know, so when they set goals, when you look at the goals wall, it's on the front wall. When I leave the house in the morning, before I go out the door, I'm going to set measurable goals. Mm. So. I love it. You know, I've got to say, I know that you, you speak all over the country, and I want to tell everybody out there, you do not have to be a builder of <laughs> anything to get a lot out of this workshop. I had never done this workshop, and I knew, I've known you for a couple years now. And I did it two weeks ago, and it is absolutely one of the best workshops I've ever done in my life. It is really transformational. And I learned a lot about myself and, and left feeling very different. So, I mean, it's, there's something really amazing about this. I guess one of the questions I have is, okay, so, so your 16-year-old son dies in a car accident, mm -hmm. and then you somehow decide to start building birdhouses, and how does that happen it, it, and relate it actually, to that? It actually trans, the whole project really, I became, I always wanted to be a woodshop teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, after Blake died, I really didn't have a lot of hope, I guess, is the, that it was very dark in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, standing at his grave on his, what would have been his 18th birthday, I decided, mm -hmm. you know what I need to do? I need to get in a classroom. Um, and so I got in a, I became a high school woodshop teacher. Okay. And those kids asked me a lot of tough questions. Wow. They were, 
a lot of adults around me didn't want to be honest, but those kids were honest and they mm -hmm. were curious and I opened my heart to them and allowed those questions and more questions developed and they told me one day I wasn't, uh, I didn't do a lesson very well and they mm -hmm. told me it was easy to be a teacher. And so I created a, uh, I created a, uh, I brought in a bunch of second graders and we built birdhouses that wow. day. And I saw <laughs> this collaboration between high school kids and that's really how the project, uh, how it started. And now you're teaching it on college level, right? I do teach construction management now. I'm, uh, you know, it's, I've made good choices, not the right choices, but good choices and along the way and it's led me to really doing what I love. I'm at home, um, regardless of where I am. I, I found that I'm just at peace within. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And where do you teach? I teach at Fort Hayes State University in Hayes, Kansas, small university out uh, nearly 60 miles from my home where I grew up. Now, uh, here you are at the Brief Parents Conference with us and a lady comes up and tells you about her child jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm -hmm. The next thing I know, she comes up and tells me that Chris Munch <laughs> is going to the Golden Gate Bridge with her and they are going to go there and build a birdhouse where her son jumped. Wow, you, you know, powerful. I, yeah, I, and that know, was yesterday. That yeah. was yesterday. Um, I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, there. As my sister said when I told her what I did yesterday. And it was your birthday. It was my birthday, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, she said, you know, most people would run from that opportunity, but my life is so different now. Um, mm -hmm. I run towards those opportunities. Right. And, and so we were there and, and got to stand and see and be together at that spot. And, and uh, it was very powerful for me as it was for her. And how healing for her. Absolutely. To be in that place and, and have this experience building this birdhouse. Yeah. And, and what did she do? Did she write her emotions about she, it? You, it? She helped you, you, she wrote the things and you put the house yeah. together for her and there? We stood and talked about everything that, uh, that, that happened and what she was thinking when she was received the call and what it was like to be there that day and mm -hmm. to stand and, and look over that railing. Well, Chris, I want to thank you so much for being on the show and I know that you can be found at uh, the Grief Toolbox. Absolutely. So, and, and also, you've got a website as yeah, well. Yeah, thebirdhouseproject.com. Thebirdhouseproject.com. And, and if you. you want Chris to come to you and do something like this, he can be there. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Grief Relief Show. I mean, watching the Grief Relief Show. And please visit us at opentohope.com.